into this wild abyss, the womb of nature and perhaps her grave, of neither sea nor shore, nor air nor fire, but all these in their pregnant causes mixed, confusedly, and which thus must ever fight, unless the almighty maker them ordain, his dark materials to create more worlds. Into this wild abyss the were fiend stood on the brink of hell and looked a while, pondering his voyage. Here Satan looks upon the chaos of the primordial void and contemplates the elemental dark materials from which God creates all things. The materials of the wild abyss contain all the necessary ingredients from which God can create more worlds. His dark materials acts as a physical manifestation of consciousness. It is from this and this alone that sentient life can emerge. The mention of his dark materials can quite possibly be a reference to the invisible dark matter that is known throughout Pullman's trilogy as dust. What is that other universe, she said? One of uncountable billions of parallel worlds. The witches have known about them for centuries, but the first theologians to prove their existence mathematically were excommunicated 50 or more years ago. However, it's true. There's no possible way to, of denying it. The universe of his dark materials is built around the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics. Though the theory is credited to Hugh Everett, he first invented it in 1957. The idea had been explored nearly half a decade earlier by Erwin Schrödinger. Nobody really took any notice of Schrödinger's idea. As such, it was branded as impossible and promptly forgotten. So when Hugh Everett developed the Many Worlds Interpretation, or MWI, he did so independently and without any foreknowledge of Schrödinger's work. And Everett's theory, for a while at least, was also ignored. Everett's version was more mathematical, Schrodinger's more philosophical, but it was Everett who introduced the idea of the universe splitting into different versions of itself when faced with quantum choices. Now, that world and every other universe came about as a result of possibility. Take the example of tossing a coin. It could come down heads or tails and we don't know before it lands which way it's going to fall. If it comes down heads, that means that the possibility of its coming down tails has collapsed. Until that moment, the two possibilities were equal. But on another world, it does come down tails. And when that happens, the two worlds split apart. I'm using the example of tossing a coin to make it clear. In fact, these possibility collapses happen at the level of elementary particles, and they happen in just the same way. One moment, several things are possible. The next moment, only one happens and the rest doesn't, except that other worlds have sprung into being on which they did happen. His Dark Materials is, in part, written as a response to C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. We need only look to the very first page to see this. Pullman makes this statement by crafting his first scene in such a way that it imitates and in turn creates a dialogue with an integral scene from The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. And this is the scene of Lucy discovering the magical land of Narnia for the very first time. This is what I call a classic image. Even if one isn't intimately familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia, I'm sure that they would recognize the image of a little girl stepping into a wardrobe. Our main protagonist, Lyra Blackwa, and her demon, Pantalaimon, also find themselves stepping into a wardrobe. However, within its confines, she doesn't find anything out of the ordinary. There are no magical worlds, no out-of-place lampposts, and no wandering fawns. Instead, Lyra Balakwa and Pantalaimon 
witness an attempted murder. The first scene with Lyra, Pantalaimon, and the wardrobe sets a precedent for the rest of the trilogy as an inversion of the Chronicles of Narnia. I know whom we must fight. It is the church. For all its history, it's tried to suppress and control every natural impulse. This is what the church does, and every church is the same. Control, destroy, obliterate every good feeling. The magisterium in Lyra's world holds an uncanny resemblance to the early modern Catholic church. This, as you could guess, is a point of contention for many. All one needs to do is turn back the clock to around 2007 and watch as various Christian groups, such as the Catholic lead, descend into a cacophony of chaos and panic due to the release of the Golden Compass film. The film, the trilogy, and the author as an extension have garnered such accusations like as selling atheism to kids, or that the film would plant the seeds for moviegoers to later then reject God. And those were some of the nicer ones. They actually created a booklet called The Golden Compass Agenda Unmasked that they distributed at Christian churches and Christian groups in the weeks leading up to the release of the film. The production studio, New Line Cinema, went as far to erase as much of the religious, or should I say, anti-religious sentiment as possible. They try to put some distance between the Church of Lyra's world and the Catholic Church of our own world. So the church in the Golden Compass is actually referred to as the Magisterium, as opposed to what they were called in the books, which was simply the Holy Church. The Magisterium, once again, in the context of the novel, was a ruling branch, a leading authority of the Holy Church. The Magisterium is actually a very real organization that exists within our own world's Catholic Church. Their function is similar to that of the Magisteriums of Lyra's world. The Magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church is the Church's authority or office to give authentic interpretation of the Word of God. Nowadays, the relationship between the church and the sciences, and you can expand this to include all of academia, is far more secular. However, this wasn't always the case. Our world has its history of persecuting philosophical thinkers whose ideas went against those spouted by the church and thus, therefore, upheld and supported by the popular majority. Galileo himself was tried by the Inquisition. Giordano Bruno was also tried, branded a heretic by Pope Clement VIII, and soon after executed. The Magisterium of Lyra's world is much the same. Their job is to survey any discoveries that could potentially have a bearing on the doctrines of the Church. Anything they find that goes against their tenets is either denounced as heretical or twisted to fit their agenda. They even go as far to post representatives within colleges and academic institutions so they can act as a censor and suppress heretical discoveries. Lyra's world is different from most. Though, as we come to learn a little bit later on, every world has its quirks. So, what is a demon, you may ask? Well, in Lyra's world, demons are the physical manifestation of a human soul. They generally tend to be the opposite gender of their human, but there are rare cases where the human and the demon are of the same gender. This may hint at certain characters being transgendered. However, we don't ever fully get an answer to that. That element of the human-demon dynamic is never fully explored. This in part reminds me of the Jungian concept of the anima and the animus, which serves as a part of Carl Jung's theory of the collective unconscious. The animus is the masculine side of a woman, the anima, the unconscious side of a man. 
The two of them together make up the psychological qualities that a male and or female possesses. Development of the animus and anima deal with cultivating independent and non-socially subjugated ideas of self. It is unfortunate that we are using very dualistic language um, in reference to gender. The terms used to describe these concepts are very much of the time in which they were created. And they saw that difference, and they knew good and evil, and they were ashamed. And they sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. He closed the book. And that was how sin came into the world, he said. Sin and shame and death. It came that moment. Their demons became fixed. During childhood, a person's demon tends to fluctuate, flitting from one form to the next, depending on the child's current temperament. However, once they reach adolescence, the shifting begins to slow down until their demon finally settles, taking on one shape for the rest of their adult life. Why do all demons have to settle? Lyra said. I want Pantalaimon to be able to change forever. So does he. Why? They have always settled, and they always will. That's part of growing up. There'll come a time when you'll be tired of his changing about, and you'll want a settled kind of form for him. I never will. Oh, you will. You want to grow up like all the other girls. Anyway, there's compensations for a settled form. What are they? Knowing what kind of person you are. The discovery of a mysterious substance called dust changed everything. Dust, as Lyra is told, is attracted to adults, but found to be absent around children. From this evidence, the church deduces that dust must be a remnant of original sin. The church's ultimate goal here is to preserve innocence and to stop the corruption of dust, or as we've said before, original sin from affecting children as they mature. One means they found in circumventing this otherwise natural process is through a little something called intercision. Intercision is a horrifying procedure that cuts away a child's or anyone's demon. Once this procedure occurs, a person is no longer linked to their demon. They're left essentially as a hollow shell of themselves lifeless, disengaged, and mentally unaware. Intercision also creates a large emission of energy, one large enough that it can cut a path across worlds. Lyra follows her father, Lord Asriel, spoilers if you didn't know, into the world in the sky. There in a crossroad world called and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Sitagatse? Probably not. She meets a boy from our world named Will Perry. At first, she's a little frightened of him. Not even a little. She's totally freaked out by him because he has no visible demon. Which, to us as the reader, shouldn't come as much of a surprise because obviously we don't have animal companions walking around with us. I mean, I, I wish we did. That would be really, really cool. But that's besides the point. Later on, Will Perry becomes the master of the subtle knife, an instrument that can cut windows into different worlds. In his dark materials, the typical Bible canon has been reversed. The good guys are now the bad guys, and the bad guys are now the good guys. The power of God or as he's called in Lyra's world, the authority is a lie. He, in truth, is nothing more than an imposter. Even though it isn't outrightly stated, especially within the context of the His Dark Materials trilogy, it seems the only thing that comes close to acting in a god type or god sort of function, and that, as we would think of it, would be the role of an ultimate creator, a being who can create sentient life, is that of dust. Dust is the only true god in the Pullman universe. Every being that exists, every sentient being, I should clarify, that exists, and this includes humans, angels, and even the authority himself, are all formed from dust. You see, the Authority was the first being that was born into creation. 
He declared himself as deity and told all the other angels who formed after him that he was the one who created them and all other beings and life within the multiverse. But this wasn't a charade that he could keep up forever. His secret was soon found out by one of his angels named Zephania. In response, the authority banished her from the kingdom of heaven. But this was not the end of her. Those who rebelled against heaven with Zephania intervened in human evolution, which resulted in human beings being given the gift of consciousness. You know, he doesn't even rule in heaven anymore. The kingdom is ruled by a regent called Metatron, an angel. He's still a person, really, intent on carrying on the good work of his master. Anak first appears in the book of Genesis, Genesis 5 to be exact, as the seventh of the ten pre-Deluge patriarchs. And when I say Deluge, I mean pretty much all the patriarchs that came before the Great Flood. All of us, even if we don't necessarily align with the Christian faith, are somewhat familiar with the tale of Noah and the Ark. Genesis 5 recounts Adam's family line from Adam to Noah, and this information includes their names, the age at which each was fathered, and their age at the time of their death. And as you go down the line, you'll notice that each of them lived for a very, very long time. All of them except for Enoch. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God for 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. So where did Enoch go? Within the context of the Bible, we don't really get any sort of answer to this until Hebrews 11.5, and it says, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Outside of this, there is no further mention of Enoch or his supposed transformation into the angel Metatron. So where did this bit of Judeo-Christian mythos come from? To find this answer, we must turn to the three books of Enoch, the Book of Enoch, or One Enoch, Two Enoch, and Three Enoch. It is an ancient Hebrew apocalyptic text, meaning that it was a genre of prophetic writing that was developed post-exilic Jewish culture. Though it is not considered to be a part of biblical canon by the vast majority of Jewish and Christian bodies, say for Beta Israel, which is Ethiopian Jews, and a couple of Ethiopian Orthodox churches. I know their names, but I also know that I will mispronounce them, so I do apologize. All three books are attributed to Enoch, and they recount how he was taken up to heaven and was appointed guardian of all the celestial treasures, made chief of the archangels, and the immediate attendant on the throne of God. He was also taught all of God's esoteric secrets, and he was given command to execute God's decrees. It's not until we get to 3 Anak where Anak is finally identified as Metatron and we get an account of his transformation. From 3 Anak chapter 9. Chapter 9. Anak receives blessings from the Most High and is adorned with angelic attributes. R. Ishmael said, Metatron, the Prince of the Presence, said to me, First, after all these things, the Holy One, blessed be he, put his hand upon me and blessed me with five thousand three hundred and sixty blessings. Second, and I was raised and enlarged to the size of the length and width of the world. Third, and he caused seventy-two wings to grow on me, thirty-six on each side, and each wing was as the whole world. Fourth, and he fixed on me three hundred and sixty-five eyes, each eyes was as the great luminary. Fifth, and he left no kind of splendor, brilliance, radiance, beauty, and all of the lights of the universe that he did not fix on me. There 
after God placed on a throne next to the throne of glory, Enoch received after this heavenly transformation the name Metatron. Why, Dr. Lincealius? What do you know about her? The witches have talked about this child for centuries past, said the consul. Because they live so close to the place where the veil between the worlds is thin, they hear immortal whispers from time to time, and the voices of those beings who pass between the worlds. And they have spoken of a child such as this, who has a great destiny that can only be fulfilled elsewhere, not in this world, but far beyond. Without this child, we shall all die. So the witches say. But she must fulfill this destiny in ignorance of what she is doing, because only in her ignorance can we be saved. Lyra's role as a child of destiny has been cemented from the beginning. Dr. Kane, the master of Jordan College, learns through his ability to read an alethiometer that Lyra will play a huge part in the events that are soon to come. He does try to prevent this. He attempts to poison Lord Azrael so that he could keep him from presenting controversial information to the college in an effort to keep his next expedition to the north from getting funded. This would, in turn, perhaps prevent Lyra from getting involved. Her father, Lord Asriel, again, spoilers, not only holds knowledge of other worlds, but he's also somebody who actively and publicly denounces the power of the Magisterium. The dangers that he faces due to his quote-unquote heretical opinions not only affects him, but Lyra as well. But it is only when Farter, Corum, and Lyra meet with the witch consul, Dr. Lensalius, that we learn that Lyra is actually at the center of a thousand-year-old witch prophecy. It isn't until the beginning of the second novel, The Subtle Knife, that the church learns anything about the prophecy. A witch who is, unfortunately, placed under extreme torture, reveals that there is something quite extraordinary about Lyra. While Mrs. Coulter is suspected of harboring secret knowledge about this prophecy, she, in truth, knows nothing. She is just as confused and flabbergasted as her accusers. It isn't until Fra Pavel, an alethiometrist for the Board of Consultorial Court of Discipline, establishes Lyra as the new Eve. If it comes about that the child is tempted like Eve was, then she is likely to fall. Thereafter, the church decides to have Lyra assassinated. I propose to send a man to find her and kill her before she can be tempted. Lyra's mother, Mrs. Coulter, kidnaps Lyra and poisons her, keeping her in a deep sleep. Will and Lyra mirror the tale of Hades and Persephone. Will steals Lyra away from her overbearing mother, Mrs. Coulter, and together they descend into the land of the dead. In this instance, Mrs. Coulter exactly parallels Demeter, as she too wishes to keep her daughter, Lyra, safe from the clutches of an organization that would seek to destroy slash corrupt her, this being Olympus slash the Magisterium, as well as keeping her innocent and free from sin, thus preventing the fall. In order to cross the Great River and gain admittance into the land of the dead, the boatman tells Lyra that she needs to leave something behind. This something is an aspect of themselves, a piece of their psyche, a bit of their soul, their demons. And when they return to the world above, something has irrevocably changed in both Will and Lyra. And this marks the beginning of Lyra's sexual slash romantic awakening. They become like witches in a way as they are able to distance themselves from their demons without dying or enduring great physical pain. And much like Hecate from myth, they are able to travel where they may, even if it is to the underworld and back. According to Greco, initiation is a mystical process of spiritual transformation in which the initiate suffers a symbolic death and is reborn into a more sacred self. Prior to her descent into the underworld, 
Persephone begins her story as an innocent maiden who is sheltered by an overbearing mother. Lyra begins the Amber Spyglass in a very similar situation. She too is still innocent, at least innocent in the eyes of the church, and has been kidnapped by her mother, Mrs. Coulter, in order to keep her out of the clutches of the Magisterium. Persephone, after descending into the underworld, falls into temptation by eating of the pomegranate seeds and returns to the surface world, irrevocably changed. Though Lyra returns to the land of the living, she still is undergoing a transformation, and her transformation isn't complete until she eats of one of the fruits and falls into temptation. When you look at what C.S. Lewis is saying, his message is so anti-life, so cruel, so unjust. The view that the Narnia books have for the material world is one of almost undisguised contempt. At one point, the old professor says, it's all in Plato, meaning that the physical world we see around us is the crude, shabby, imperfect, second-rate copy of something much better. I want to emphasize the simple physical truth of things, the absolute primacy of the material life rather than the spiritual life or the afterlife. Pullman's World of the Dead takes heavy influence from the Greek afterlife. So there are three levels where a soul can go. They can go to the Elysian Fields, the Asphodel Meadows, or they can go to Tartarus. The Elysian Fields were for the good and righteous. There, souls could forever be happy. Tartarus was where the evil and treacherous souls were sent. Once there, they would live out the rest of eternity in horrible torment. The land of the dead, however, is synonymous with the fields of Asphodel. So this was a section of the underworld where ordinary souls who lived a life neither of good or evil were sent to live after death. The term Asphodel comes from a flower that is ghostly and pale. Pullman's land of the dead is much like these flowers, as it too is a pale copy of the world the real world that it is supposed to mirror. We can notice here a direct inversion with Narnia. The Narnia within Aslan's country is considered to be perfect, while the more earthly Narnia, that is the Narnia that we are first introduced to in you know, the first six books, is considered to be an imperfect second-rate copy of, again, the real Narnia that lies within Aslan's country. Historic Materials has it the other way around. In Pullman's eyes, it is the afterlife that is a pale, second-rate copy of the land of the living. The ghosts, once they are freed from the land of the dead, actually rejoice at being able to once again rejoin and dissolve into the land of the living. Pullman, in this section of the Amber Spyglass, also takes characters and even creatures that we see in Greek mythology and puts them in his land of the dead. So we have Charon the ferryman. In his dark materials, he is merely called the boatman. Much like Charon in Greek mythology, he ferried the souls of the dead to the underworld slash land of the dead. Often souls have to give a form of payment in order to cross the great river. Lyra, Will, and the Galavespians, in order to cross the great lake, have to leave an aspect of themselves, their souls, behind. We also have harpies. Um, they look very similar to how they are portrayed in Greek myth as a creature having the head and breasts of a human female with the body and wings of a bird. Originally in Greek mythology, they were wind spirits. They were seen as being snatchers who either stole food from evildoers or grabbed people up and delivered them either to the Furies or to Tartarus. They were also associated with Zeus. They were literally known as the Hounds of Zeus and were the ones who doled out his punishments. Their association with Hades and the Underworld as guardians of the Underworld came later on. And we also have the River Styx. Though in the Amber Spyglass it isn't called that, it's merely this large body of water that the dead must cross in order to get from the suburbs of the dead to the land of the dead. Once there, if enough time passes, a ghost begins to forget who they once were.
let me introduce to you the figures that will play a part in the fall of man. First off, we have Will and Lyra, who are the new Adam and the new Eve. The figure of Satan is divided, much like it is in Narnia, between two characters. Though it's technically three because uh, we have the character, uh, the angel Zephania, who is the actual real-life Lucifer, or at least the angel who inspired the character of Lucifer from the Bible. The devil can archetypally be split into two figures, that of Lucifer, the morning star, and that of Satan, or the devil. We can see this in the modern divide between Luciferianism and Satanism. There is a lot of fluidity when it comes to belief systems. Just look at the number of denominations that exist just within Christianity. So everything that I described when it comes to these two belief systems are incredibly generalized. Um, it's not really a one-size-fits-all kind of situation. Luciferianism venerates characteristics that are attributed to Lucifer. He is seen as a symbol of enlightenment, independence, and human progression. He can be likened to modern interpretations of Prometheus and Lilith. Now, Satanism, on the other hand, encourages individualism, hedonism, and self-realization. It's all about embracing experiences associated with the physical world and the physical experience and not about shunning them or abstaining from them due to spiritual guilt or to appease a higher power. Lord Azrael comes about as the figure of Lucifer, the fallen angel. He is a devilishly charming theologian scholar, wishes to lead a host of rebel angels against the kingdom of heaven to create a new democratic alternative called the Republic of Heaven. Now, Mary Malone, who is a nun turned physicist, acts as Satan, the tempter. She tells 12-year-old Lyra about a sexual-slash-romantic experience that led her to leaving the convent. Her tale really emphasizes the importance of living a life on one's own terms, rather than in the service of a higher power that may or may not exist. Her story, in a sense, was a key. It gave Lyra the knowledge that she needed in order to reenact the fall of man. I knew I couldn't go back to the convent after that. I couldn't bear the idea of living without ever feeling that alive. And I thought, will anyone be better off if I just go back to my hotel and say my prayers and never fall into temptation again? And the answer came back, no, no one will. And I realized there was no one there rewarding me for being a good girl or no one there to punish me for being wicked. There was no one and it was, it was liberating. I just knew I wanted to experience everything the world had to offer. I gotta say, with regards to the His Dark Materials show, and I will elaborate on this a little bit further on in another video, they made such a good creative choice when it came to Mary's story. So in the books, Mary falls in love with a man. However, in the show, they changed it so that Mary fell in love with a woman. And this really would help to strengthen her resolve in distancing herself and becoming disenfranchised from the church. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Isaiah fourteen twelve. Pride cometh before the fall. This is a statement that Lucifer could attest to. Lucifer, within his dark materials, is presented more as a Promethean-type figure. Though Satan slash Lucifer and Prometheus both serve a similar function in their respective mythologies, the intention or the reason behind the initial rebellion differs greatly between the two. Now, when I'm going to be talking about Satan slash Lucifer, I'm going to be kind of pulling his characterizations from two sources. One would be biblical canon, and then the other would be from John Milton's Paradise Lost. In Judeo-Christian mythology, Lucifer is described as being a selfish creature, one who felt confined by the hierarchy God has set in place. When I think of John Milton's characterization of Satan, um, 
I like to think of him as someone who would be highly involved in the self-improvement community. Um, his whole ambition is to rise above his station, to raise his throne above the stars of God and make himself like the Most High. However, it was his own ambition that led to his ultimate downfall. In the context of the Bible and Paradise Lost, God's will is paramount. You are as you are, you are as you are created to be, and you cannot become more than that. In rebelling against God, and you can extend this to say, rebelling against the laws of nature or the laws of the universe, Satan ended up becoming lower than the lowest of those he used to rule. His attempt to raise himself higher resulted in a complete reversal of his entire being and status. And so, in his diminished state, spiteful and hypocritical, he sought to tarnish God's perfect creations, which were Adam and Eve, and, well, you know the rest of the story. Satan tempts Eve with fruit from the tree of knowledge or the tree of good and evil, appealing to her hubris that her and Adam might become like gods. Remember, humans are created in God's likeness. In Paradise Lost, Satan gives God human attributes. He claims that God doesn't want his creations to eat from the tree of knowledge, as he feared that it would make humans better or equal to him. Envious commands invented with design to keep them low whom knowledge might exalt equal with gods. Now, Prometheus from Greek mythology plays the role of both God and Satan. In a time before humans, there was the gods and the titans. There were two titans, Prometheus and his twin brother, Epimetheus, who betrayed their fellows and joined with the gods to defeat their fellow titans. After the titans were punished or sent to Tartarus, Zeus tasked the two brothers with creating the animals of the earth and giving the creatures traits of the gods. So Epimetheus created animals, while it was Prometheus who shaped humans from the clay of the earth. Well, to be fair, it was a collaboration between Athena and Prometheus. Now, I love the fact that, you know, before everything went down, before Zeus was before Zeus was being Zeus and Prometheus rebelled against them, Athena and Prometheus were bros. They were total bros. Like, you know, once everything with the Titans was settled, like, Athena invited him into her home and, like, taught him a bunch of cool stuff, like, taught him mathematics and astronomy and architecture and just, and all of this cool stuff. And so when Prometheus showed Athena his creation. She was so impressed with his work that she just went ahead and breathed life into humanity. That's so cool. But by the time that humans came around, Epimetheus had already gone around, made a bunch of animals, gave them traits of the gods, and by the time he got around to humans, he had no other traits to give. And Zeus, being Zeus, uh, was okay with this even though humans looked like the gods and were also, you know, much like human, how humans were created in the Bible, were made in the gods' likeness, that it was fitting that they were landlocked and dumb and the only thing that they ever did was worship the gods. And Prometheus, seeing this, was greatly insulted. He thought that his creation should have more importance and that they should live a life with greater purpose than just worshipping the gods. Zeus forbade humans from having fire. Without it, the great god knew that humans would suffer and would stay weak and not grow. And so Prometheus, enraged and pissed off, climbed up to Hephaestus' forge and stole a spark of god's fire. It was then that he brought fire, as well as knowledge, to humans. He taught them everything that Athena had taught him. Mathematics, architecture, language, and how to forge metal. And with this, civilization grew. Some humans rose to power and became kings and great leaders, while others were 
enslaved by their own kind. But there was one common attitude and belief that well, many of the humans shared, and it was that they begun to see themselves as gods and shunned and questioned the authority of Zeus and the Olympians. Zeus didn't like this. Of course he didn't. And so Zeus sentenced Prometheus to his fate. Prometheus was to be bound to a rock, and every day a vulture was going to come down and eat his liver. And then when the next day came, his liver would grow back and the vulture would come again and eat it, and the same thing would happen day in, day out, again and again, until the end of time. Now, I've already spoken on the character of Zephania, and Zephania in His Dark Materials is pretty much like the real-life version of Lucifer. She, like her biblical counterpart Satan, and Prometheus intervened in human evolution and gave humans the gift of consciousness. All of these stories converge around a single point, and that point is knowledge and the spark of conscious awareness is the key to unlocking the fall of man. Or if we were to look at it from a Promethean perspective, one could see it in truth as being humanity's rise. In the original Genesis story, the space of Eden is a place of childhood, an innocence that is lost upon the eating of a forbidden fruit. Adam and Eve are childlike in their state of unknowingness, in their lack of shame and oneness with all the creatures of the earth and air. One could say that they are just another animal here, roaming on the newly formed earth. Their demons are unfixed, which signifies their immaturity. Remember, unfixed demons are found only with children in Lyra's world. It is only after they eat the fruit from the tree that they are granted knowledge, that of good and evil, that of awareness of self and separateness. Some would call this a blessing, others a curse, and are able to discover the true forms of their demons. Before the serpent and the fruit, to Adam and Eve, there was no difference between their internal world or their self-concept and that of the external. Inner and outer were in harmony, and there was no disjunction. Dust or dark matter is established as the reason for intelligent conscious life, as dust sticks to or is attracted to adults and is absent around children, it can be deduced that the presence of dust is indicative of experience and everything that comes with it. In the Blakean sense, independence, agency, and sexual maturity. Lyra offers Will a fruit, and in realizing their love for each other, kiss, thus fulfilling the second fall. Dust that had been leaking away through the abyss created by the bomb and all the unsealed doors created by the subtle knife is attracted back into the world and once again finds its home in sentient beings, preserving consciousness. The exile from paradise is seen as a necessary loss of innocence and a gain of experience, and thereby allows Pullman to reframe the fall of man into a positively charged coming-of-age narrative for young readers. The act of falling here is used as a metaphorical device to explore the processes of adolescence and maturation. It is seen as a necessary rite of passage where one, once they reach a certain age and attain a certain modicum of self-knowledge slash awareness, are forced from the protections of paradise, of innocence or childhood, even though not everyone can consider their childhood a paradise, and must make their way out into the world, beginning the tumultuous journey of self-knowledge, an often internal one. So through all of this comes the question, is His Dark Materials a work of atheistic fantasy, as many critics would like to call it, or as Philip Pullman would like it to be seen as? Short answer, no. And there are several reasons for this. For one, the question of the ultimate creator is still very much ambiguous. It's all kind of left up in the air. The authority that we see in the books is the God of the Christian Bible. 
He may be a false god and imposter, but it's still him. There's also a huge undercurrent of spiritualism that runs throughout the entire series. For one, we see several characters using tools and instruments of divination. Lyra has her lithiometer, and Mary uses the I Ching as well as her computer to speak with dust, or the consciousness behind dust. We also have the character of Stanislaus Grumman. Spoiler alert, well, Perry's missing father, who, once he's trapped in Lyra's world, becomes a shaman. And, you know, in the subtle knife, because, well, he doesn't really make it past the second He doesn't really make it past the second book, and I'm just going to leave it at that. But in the subtle knife, we get to see him use astral projection. We also get to see Mary use astral projection in towards the end of The Amber Spyglass, when she kind of releases kind of releases her consciousness from her body and she gets trapped in that tidal wave of dust that's like being pulled out of and leaking out of the universe and she almost gets permanently separated from her body. There's also one point in the second book where Stanislaus Grumman slash John Perry kind of has a bit of an avatar moment and he ends up manipulating the winds so that Lee Squirsby's so that, you know, Lee's blimp can go faster. Then in Lyra's world, they have witches. Um, we see them use magic and their magic isn't necessarily bound to their world. Uh, we see this when, um, we see this when Serafina meets with Will and Lyra in Chittagatse and she attempts to heal Will's hand after his fingers are sort of shorn off by the subtle knife. And if we go a little bit further into the sequel series, the Book of Dust trilogy, we also know that there are apparently other magical creatures, such as fairies in Lyra's world. Who would have known? So is Philip Pullman, and to a greater extent, his dark materials against Christianity and even theism as a whole? This is an interesting question. Um, though he spends a lot of time in the books denying Christianity, his books still figure within the Christian mythos. Certain figures and characters within the Bible, or even characters that are in more mystic Judeo-Christian texts, still appear and still exists within Pullman's universe, even though, again, they aren't exactly as they appear in the Bible. And of course, there is my favorite, the dust theory, that dust is the one and only true god of the Pullman universe. Before we can dive into panpsychism, I like to introduce the intricacies of the mind-body connection. The mind-body problem is a debate that spans across multiple disciplines. It is seen extensively throughout philosophy, as well as in many scientific disciplines. For as long as we can remember, these two modes of looking at the mind have been more or less distinct from one another. Philosophy looks at the mind-body problem in a nebulous manner, studying the interaction of consciousness from that of the physical body. Scientific disciplines tend to examine it from a materialistic slash reductive physicalism perspective, where consciousness is simply a natural occurrence arising from the physical processes of the human brain. The philosophy of the mind has been debated for several centuries, even going back as far as the 5th century BCE. Some of the first recorded bits of philosophical thought on this subject were composed by well-known philosophers such as Plato and Socrates. Most early thought, and even within our contemporary world, the most popular medium for seeing the mind is through a theory called dualism. So dualism proposes that the mind, and when I'm using the term mind, it can be synonymous here with consciousness or even human soul, that the mind and the body are two separate things. One of the most famous proponents for dualism was René Descartes. Explored in his 1641 work, Meditations on First Philosophy, he suggests that the mind differs from that of the physical substance in three ways. 
One, the mind experiences sensations that cannot be explained mechanically. Two, the mind does not exist in a physical space like the brain does. And three, the mind is a necessary whole. It cannot be divided or replicated in the same way that a physical object can. From this, he deduced that he could conceive of the mind existing without the body, and that the mind, therefore, had to be made of a different substance than that of the brain. So the main issue with the theory of dualism is that it neglects the problem of interaction. If the mind and the body are two separate substances, then how do they interact? René Descartes tries to explain this with the theory of interactionism. Even though the mind and body are distinct from one another, there is a causal interaction between the two of them. He did observe that through a physical event that happened to the body, the mind can be affected through something that he calls a disturbance. So say, if I stub my toe on a chair, I'm going to feel the sensation of pain. And he did note the correlation between the two. But again, as this was the 17th century, he didn't really have the scientific know-how to explain or fully understand the mechanisms behind that connection. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have a theory called materialism. Materialism holds that matter is the fundamental substance found in nature, and that all things, including mental states and consciousness, are results of material interaction. Simply put, that mental state that we signify as the mind or consciousness comes about as a consequence of biochemical processes within the brain. It agrees with another philosophical theory called reductive physicalism, which means that everything in the world is both physical and adheres to the laws of physics. It pretty much states there is no you that it's separate from your brain. Your soul, your consciousness, is really just what the brain does. Your mental state is a reflection of the workings or processes of your brain. Panpsychism offers a middle way between the two. The worry with dualism, the view that the mind and matter are fundamentally different kinds of things, is that it leaves us with a radically disunified picture of nature and the deep difficulty of understanding how mind and brain interact. And whilst physicalism offers a simple and unified vision of the world, this is arguably at the cost of being unable to give a satisfactory account of the emergence of human and animal consciousness. So now that we've arrived at the question, what is panpsychism? Panpsychism is a theory of consciousness that postulates that mentality or the mind is a fundamental component of nature or that the intrinsic state of matter is to be conscious. Opposed to dualism, panpsychism is a modest theory. It in its own way, solves the mind-body problem, or the split between the mind and the body. By proposing the idea that there's one substance in reality, but that there are different components to it. There's the physical side as described by physics and the sciences, and there's the phenomenal experiential side to reality, the sensations that we feel in our mind, the experience as it's felt by us. In a 2020 interview with the Nautilus, Philip Pullman's thoughts on panpsychism are, We are clearly made of matter. We can look at every cell, every atom, every molecule in our bodies, and it's all matter. You can't find any spirit there, no matter how much you cut it up, but it is nonetheless conscious. And the traditional way of explaining this is to say the body does material things, and the spirit does the consciousness. But that's become harder and harder to believe. All the scientific explanations for consciousness seem to stumble or fall or come against a paradox, which is irreconcilable. What panpsychism does, and this is what I like about it, is to suggest that consciousness is a normal property of matter. We accept that mass is a normal property of matter, and so is electric charge. If you view consciousness as a state in which matter can exist, then the problem goes. And shadow matter is what we have called spirit. From what we are, spirit. From what we do, matter. Matter and spirit are one. Now, there are different levels to this. Panpsychism doesn't say that everything is conscious or that everything has the same level of consciousness. All one needs to do is look around to know that that's not true. As Philip Pullman says, that's not to say that the cup of tea from which I am now drinking is conscious and saying to me, come on, hurry up. You haven't finished this yet, or to say that every leaf on the tree is as conscious as I am. 
the analogy between dust and panpsychism isn't one for one. Philip Pullman did not go into writing his dark materials with the intention of making dust a metaphor for panpsychism. Most of the connections that were made between the two came long after the series had been published. So the notion that the world is alive, the world is conscious, is something that I find very persuasive. You don't have to believe in a Christian God or a Muslim God to believe that. So there's a little something I wanted to add about panpsychism. As I said before, the analogy between dust and panpsychism isn't one for one. That being said, I think that there are certain attributes of dust that align a little bit more with pan-protopsychism rather than just panpsychism. The two are very similar, but panpsychists tend to think that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous part of matter and nature, whilst pan-protopsychists think that proto-consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous aspect of matter. So... When we say proto-consciousness, uh, we are referring to certain properties. Uh, in the case of his dark materials, we can talk about dust or you know shadow particles, shadow matter, dark matter, whatever you want to call it. And it states that those properties themselves are not conscious. However, they in combination give rise to forms or beings that have a higher level of consciousness. This aligns with dust in his dark materials. Angels are said to be beings that are created from complexifications of dust. There is still that question of whether dust itself is conscious or not. Remember in The Subtle Knife when Mary is speaking to dust using the cave, the machine that she had built, she wasn't communicating with dust itself, but rather she was communicating with an angel, Zephania, who was, you know, answering her questions and guiding her so that she could be in the Mulefa world when Will and Lyra eventually ended up there. But again, the analogy between dust and panpsychism, or in this case, panprotopsychism, isn't one for one. There are still so many questions about dust, about its origins, about its function in the universe that have yet to be answered. And, and I hope that when Philip Pullman finally releases The Book of Dust, Book 3, we finally get some answers. Ultimately, the theme of Pullman's books really deals with appreciating the physical life over that of the spiritual one. He proposes that instead of trying to live a life where we are curbing our own instincts to appease a higher power and to get into some idea of heaven or another more perfect world, that we should really focus on living our life to the fullest. Because at the end of the day, he says that these ideas that religion presents to us of an afterlife are merely that, ideas. And the best thing that we can do is focus on living our lives here on Earth and on building a better world, or as Philip Pullman calls it, building a republic of heaven on each of our own worlds. A life well lived on one's own terms is privileged over a life sacrificed for a greater power.